true events, morality tales, or spiritual allegory. The Gospels record the parables and sayings of Jesus, but also stories of miracles and exorcisms. I don't know what to believe. While many of these narratives or sayings are recorded in each of the Gospels, they are presented in a different order or grouped together to drive a particular point home. And of course, there are the supernatural elements. So how are we modern readers able to understand this unique way in which the Gospel writers have presented us with these stories? Welcome to the Bible Paladin and thank you for joining me. Today we're going to read two stories in which Jesus shows his authority but also deals with some supernatural phenomena that some people might dismiss as mythological or even fictional. It's all a lot of simple tricks and nonsense. Others may believe that people did experience these events but didn't understand them, and so they try to find more modern explanations, such as seeing demonic possession as mental illness. Then there are those who do see these as real historical events that have been recorded by the evangelists. And finally, some see these or interpret them as allegorical stories that really just tell a particular spiritual or theological meaning. And while the Gospels are a unique genre of storytelling, these stories may go a lot deeper than any of these theories suggest. So I invite you to stick around. And I show you how deep the rabbit hole goes. And while you're here, don't forget to like and subscribe. We'll begin right where we left off last time. Jesus is in a boat preaching to the crowds who are gathered on the shore. And it seems that the apostles were with him in the boat because every once in a while he would turn aside and explain to them the meaning of the parables out of earshot from the rest of the crowds. Now, I used to think about small fishing boats and wonder how all 13 of them fit into one boat. But I remember seeing a display of what a large fishing boat might have looked like in Jesus' time when I was in Galilee. This was based on a find in 1986 when a couple of fishermen, who were also amateur archaeologists, found an old boat in the Sea of Galilee. Carbon dating estimates that this boat would have been used sometime between 120 BC and AD 40, and has hence been nicknamed the Jesus Boat. The boat would have been large enough to hold 15 people. Now, whether or not this was the style of boat in the particular story we will hear, we don't know. But it was possible that they were all in one boat, although we are told that other boats were present during the event. But before discussing this too much more, let's dive into the text. I pray for the guidance of the Holy Spirit as we read these words. That day when evening came, he said to his disciples, Let us go over to the other side. Leaving the crowd behind, they took him along just as he was in the boat. There were also other boats with him. A furious squall came up, and the waves broke over the boat, so that it was nearly swamped. Jesus was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion. The disciples woke him and said to him, Teacher, don't you care if we drown? He got up, rebuked the wind, and said to the waves, Quiet, be still. Then the wind died down, and it was completely calm. He said to his disciples, Why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? They were terrified and asked each other, Who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. So evening comes, Jesus finishes his sermon, and he tells his disciples that they are going to cross to the other side of the lake. And since they were already in the boat, and a third of the disciples were seasoned fishermen, this would be an easy task, or so they thought. And then we hear about the furious storm, and yet Jesus is sleeping. So let's talk about the storm first, the violent storm of wind, the storm that threatened to sink the boat, the storm that so terrified the apostles. A Cusco's poison. The poison chosen specially to kill Cusco. The poison for Cusco. Okay, so maybe I oversold the storm, but you get the idea. And remember, it was also dark. Let's go back for a moment to the second verse of the first chapter of Genesis. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. In the creation story, the earth was described as a dark and formless sea before God spoke. Many scholars believe that some of the symbolism echoed that of other creation stories in which a deity had to battle the forces of darkness and chaos in order to create. In the Genesis account, it would take God's voice to bring order out of chaos. We'll get back to that. Then the disciples awaken him and ask him why he's not concerned that they are about to perish. Now, there's a lot to unpack here. First, Jesus had just got finished telling the apostles how they were chosen by him and how privileged they were to have the parables explained to them. Now, at the first sign of danger, they panic. So indeed, where is their faith? 
To be fair, the fact that they ask Jesus for help, in my opinion, does speak to their faith. With 12 men, at least four of them who grew up on the lake, trying to manage the boat and get rid of the water that's flowing in, how much help would this carpenter from Nazareth really add? Unless he had some unique power, unless he is more than just a carpenter, more than just a teacher. Their question to him suggests that they do believe that he and only he can save them. Yet their tone is filled with fear that shows they still have doubt. And so what does Jesus do? He immediately rebukes the wind and tells the sea to be silent. Hmm, who else does Jesus rebuke in silence? Impure spirits, agents of chaos and death. Here, Jesus takes the role of the creator and cuts through the chaotic sea, just like in the stories of old. His voice is indeed the voice of God. This scene echoes the first day of creation, and this is not lost on the apostles. After Jesus calms the storm, he asks his apostles why that they are fearful or afraid. And the Greek word used is deloi, which means to be timid or scared. And Jesus asks them this because of their lack of faith. And then they say to one another, who is this that even the wind and the waves obey him? Yet I suspect they already knew the answer. There's only one being with such power. When they said this, we are told that they again had great fear, but now the word used is phobos. And while this is where we get the word for phobia, it is also in the expression fear of the Lord. And this really is the appropriate response for someone who realizes that they are in the presence of God. Another interesting bit of theological interpretation is that in the beginning of this story, Jesus is sleeping, a very human thing to do. In fact, Elijah mocks the pagan god Baal by telling his prophets that he must be sleeping, indicating that he was not a god at all. But for Christians, the assertion that Jesus slept tells us something different. The belief in the dual nature of Jesus is shown very prominently in these passages. Being fully human, he needed rest after a day of preaching in the sun. Yet, he commands the wind and the sea, proving that he is also fully divine. And I think that this interpretation goes back to the question that I asked at the beginning of this video. Is this and other supernatural stories meant to be understood allegorically or literally? And I think that the answer is yes, both and. I don't get it. We can appreciate it as an historical event but also see how the placement and the wording of the sacred author really shows the deeper meaning of the text. And this can also be seen in this next story of the Gerasene demoniac, or as we might say today, the man from the Gerasenes who is struggling with the possessive behavior of an impure spirit. Yeah, let's just read the story. They went across the lake to the region of the Gerasenes. When Jesus got out of the boat, a man with an impure spirit came from the tombs to meet him. This man lived in the tombs, and no one could bind him any more, not even with a chain. For he had often been chained hand and foot, but he tore the chains apart and broke the irons on his feet. No one was strong enough to subdue him. Night and day, among the tombs and in the hills, he would cry out and cut himself with stones. When he saw Jesus from a distance, he ran and fell on his knees in front of him. He shouted at the top of his voice, what do you want with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? In God's name, don't torture me. For Jesus had said to him, Come out of this man, you impure spirit. Then Jesus asked him, What is your name? My name is Legion, he replied, for we are many. And he begged Jesus again and again not to send them out of the area. A large herd of pigs was feeding on a nearby hillside. The demons begged Jesus, send us among the pigs, allow us to go into them. He gave them permission, and the impure spirits came out and went into the pigs. The herd, about two thousand in number, rushed down the steep bank into the lake and were drowned. First, we are told that the area or territory was that of the Gerasenes. At least Mark and Luke tell us that. Matthew records it as the Gadarenes. And now early scholars such as Origen debated on the exact location of where this would have taken place, but he also said that that wasn't the real focus of the story. So what was the point of the story and this particular area? What is significant was that this was in the Decapolis, which was an area of 10 cities mostly influenced by Hellenistic or Greco-Roman culture. The most likely spot would be Gergesa, which was a small village on the eastern bank of Galilee and also a place where there were steep hills coming down to the shoreline. 
which is unusual around most of the lake. Caves and tombs have been found on this mountainside as well, and both of these details do fit the narrative. Speaking of tombs, this is where the man was living, if you could even call it that. He was there amongst the tombs, and he was harming himself. He couldn't be restrained. Now, remember what we had said in an earlier episode about the importance of impurity and the connection that it had to death and how Jesus was here to fight against those things. Well, this story, as well as the two healings that will follow it, really highlight this particular message in the gospel. And so here he is amongst the tombs, which is truly a symbol of death. The gospel also gives more evidence that this is indeed a demonic possession. The man has unnatural strength, and he speaks to Jesus not with his own voice, but with that of the beings by which he is possessed. And they have knowledge that has not yet been revealed to the man. They call Jesus Son of God the Most High and believe that he is there to torture him. Who else can punish demons but God? And if they believe they are about to be punished, it must mean that their time is coming to an end. Something incredible is about to happen in salvation history. And yet the demons do not come out of the man initially. And so Jesus asks its name. Now, remember the belief that knowing a person's name really gave the person who knows it some sort of control over that which he is asking. Now, Jesus didn't need this, but perhaps he said this for the apostles who would have been watching this whole event. Maybe Jesus was using this as a teachable moment for when they would have to perform exorcisms. So this is where the demon reveals their name as legion and that they are many. Now, the word legion could mean a large number, as the demons say, But it was also a military term, and a Roman legion would often contain 4,500 to 6,000 soldiers. So this was a lot of impure spirits. Now, they continue this conversation and actually seem to want Jesus to drive them out of the man as long as he lets them remain in the area. In fact, they beg him to send them into the herd of swine, and Jesus does permit them. Of course, they would only be able to do this if Jesus did allow them to do so. But this still begs the question, why would they want Jesus to put them into this herd of swine? And why would Jesus do that? And this goes back to the question of impurity. Swine are considered unclean animals and are even so named in the Torah. And that is why even to this day, Jews and Muslims and others do not eat pork. Demons are also unclean, and they would rather dwell in those animals than face whatever the Lord has in store for them. They know their time is limited. Of course, the pigs are overwhelmed by the spirits and promptly run into the sea and drown. Jesus knew exactly what would happen, so he sends them into the herd of swine instead of letting them loose into the air. Impure spirits for impure animals. But the story doesn't end here, and so let's continue reading and see what happens to the man. Those tending the pigs ran off and reported this in the town and countryside, and the people went out to see what had happened. When they came to Jesus, they saw the man who had been possessed by the legion of demons sitting there dressed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. Those who had seen it told the people what had happened to the demon-possessed man, and told about the pigs as well. Then the people began to plead with Jesus to leave their region. As Jesus was getting into the boat, the man who had been demon-possessed begged to go with him. Jesus did not let him, but said, Go home to your own people and tell them how much the Lord has done for you, and how he has had mercy on you. So the man went away, and began to tell in the Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him, and all the people were amazed. A few things are happening in these verses. So let's start with the people who lived in this area. Now remember, this was a Gentile area. Those pigs were someone's, perhaps the source of a lot of people's livelihood. The people heard what had happened, both to the man and to the pigs, but they really don't seem to care about the man. They have lost their filthy pigs, about 2,000 heads of swine, So they plead for Jesus to leave town. What more damage might this itinerant Jewish preacher inflict on them? Now, as an avid gamer in my youth, I can't help but imagine this whole story as a type of side quest in a video game. Nerd! I know, I know, but just bear with me. So as Jesus is traveling through this pagan town, he has this opportunity to cast out demons from this man. Now, once he has the upper hand, he has a few choices. Release the demons and fight with them drive out the demons and send them straight to Gehenna, cast out the demons and send them into a nearby herd of pigs, and of course we have to add the one that will give you some bad karma. Set the demons free so they can possess someone else. 
And so Jesus chooses the craziest, and I might add, the most fun option. Of course, an option that will probably reduce his reputation with the Gerasene Gentile faction and the Pig Farmers Guild. So yeah, I don't think he'll be getting a reward for this quest, but definitely some XP. Hey, gotta have a bit of fun, right? But getting back to the story, what about the man himself? How does he react? So we see him sitting there, fully dressed and in his right mind. I think the fact that Mark mentions that he has new clothes kind of gives off a liturgical vibe. You might even say that he is born anew. And of course, his response derives directly from this because he wants to go with Jesus. He wants to follow him. And interestingly enough, Jesus does not let him. Jesus is making all sorts of unpredictable choices this time. First, he tells the man to go home and to tell his family what had happened. Wait, this is new too. Usually when Jesus heals someone, he tells them not to tell anybody what happened. So what's going on? Well, first, this person will have a different ministry than the apostles. He is told to go preach to his family and friends. Also, he is not Jewish. So Jesus isn't as concerned that the story will be picked up by the Pharisees and other Jewish leaders. Jesus is low-key allowing this man to start the Gentile ministry, which will later be continued by the apostles. So let's return to the original question. When we hear this story, are we to see it simply as an account of an exorcism or perhaps as an allegory to speak about our journey with Christ? And like I mentioned before, I don't see any reason why we can't see it as both. As the evangelists often do, they take the experience and stories of the apostles and write them in such a way to reveal theological and spiritual truths. As we hear the story today, we can imagine ourselves in the place of the demon-possessed man. The impure spirits represent sin and the effects of sin. Demons, after all, are those who have fully rejected God. When we allow sin to take over our lives, we may feel powerful and strong and won't let anyone convince us otherwise. No amount of good advice or God talk will bring us to our senses. We believe that we are not bound like those believers are. We have broken free of religion, and we don't realize that we are only hurting ourselves and ultimately living amongst the dead, because this is the final destination of sin. Then we have an encounter with the Lord. But perhaps we are suspect. I find it interesting that the man's first response is the belief that Jesus is there to punish or torment him. How often have we heard a friend or family member laugh when we may invite them to worship or church? They might respond with something like, well, if I go there, the building will collapse on me, or I'll be burnt by the holy water, or lightning will strike me. Well, I think there's kind of a masked guilt in some of these um, humorous responses. They come from a place of acknowledging sinfulness and being deserving of punishment, but it's said in a mocking way, in a way to dismiss it. It also comes from a place of misunderstanding. They believe that the Lord is there first to punish. But what has Jesus' whole ministry been about? Healing and forgiveness. So let's see what Jesus says to the man. First, he tells the demons to leave him. Jesus wants to take away our sin. He wants to remove them. Then he asks what its name is. It is important to name our sins, our addictions, our faults. Because once we name them, such as the ancient belief says, then we will have some sort of power or control over them. This has even been ritualized, both in counseling practices as well as in various faith traditions. Whether you are writing your sins down and burning them, or confessing them to a priest, it is important to name them, take ownership, and let the Lord remove them. The man is even able to see visibly the utter destruction of those sins, those impure spirits that had taken over his life as they perish in the sea. And finally, once we have been forgiven, we can have an honest conversation with the Lord. The man who was healed wanted to leave everything and follow Jesus, but he was told that that was not his calling. His responsibility was at his home. He had to be an example for his family, his people. Jesus was calling him to something else, to share his experience with others, and to bring the good news to those around him. And that, my friends, is a powerful story and perhaps a story that many of us may have experienced ourselves. Thank you so much for joining me, and perhaps this may inspire you to share your own story with others, maybe even here in this little YouTube community. And so please join me next time as we continue to hear about how Jesus combats impurity and brings new life. Until then, have a blessed day.
Wait, before you go, I just want to share with you a product that is really helpful if you want to study and read the Bible. And if you really do want to study and get deeper into the Bible, which I know you do because you've stayed to the end of this video, you're really going to like this product. It's called Logos Bible Software. Logos contains a powerful Bible study and sermon prep platform that allows you to study scripture and consult commentaries, devotionals, Bible dictionaries, and more, all from your computer, tablet, or phone. And most importantly, with Logos platform, you can easily search and store hundreds and thousands of books. Every Logos book, from commentaries to biblical studies, resources, to Christian living books, is enhanced with thousands of tags that connect one resource to another in your Logos library. There are some links in this description if you want to begin your journey with Logos. And if you do order from one of these links, you'll get a lot of deals and maybe some free books, and it'll also help this channel. So thank you so much, and God bless.